You're listening to another episode of the Turn Autism Around podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Mary Barbera, and I'm thrilled that you are here. Today, I am talking all about how to build receptive language abilities, how to assess comprehension, how to teach it, when to use visuals, how to fade prompts, and all the things that are so important to teaching kids to comprehend our language. So let's get to this special episode. Now we're going to talk about receptive language or understanding of language or following directions. They're all tied and so importantly to um, language and language comprehension. People talk about reading comprehension, but a child can't have reading comprehension be before they have language comprehension. So whether your child has a diagnosis or not, whether they are two years old, five, 12, 16, 25, 45 years of age, when you're talking about a person, a child or a person with autism, um, in addition to uh, assessing and teaching them needed expressive language skills, it's probably even more important to assess and teach them to their, their receptive language, their understanding of language. And I have so many examples of this, even with my own son, who's now 23, diagnosed over two decades ago. Um, I remember when he was really little, a photographer came to our house to take pictures of him and Spencer. I think Spencer was six and, uh, six months, excuse me. And Lucas was two ish, but he wasn't diagnosed with autism. We, we weren't really even thinking autism at that point. I wasn't at, at, at least. And, um, the photographer asked Lucas, he just was giving Lucas something to do. He's like, he's two. He's like, Hey buddy, go throw this in the trash. And Lucas like took it and just dropped it. Like he had no idea what the photographer was talking about. And I think the photographer even said like, how old is he again? And I said two. And he's just like, like he should be throwing out the trash. Like, and, and one of the big things that made my husband think that Lucas might have autism was his lack of reaction to the baby. When, when Spencer was born, Lucas was 18 months of age and Lucas was not understanding anything. He wasn't understanding, um, there's a baby in mommy's belly. There, there was, there was no understanding that he was a brother. There was, we could have brought home a fake doll for as much as Lucas was understanding the situation. So that's a, that's a really, uh, powerful, I think, example of like how, um, kind of in, in his own world, uh, a child could be, um, we, we also, once we did start to get him evaluated, um, they had, I remember them asking me the the, uh, three to five, uh, age program that he was in. I remember filling out a form or them asking me, does he touch his body parts? And I was like, oh yeah, yeah, he can do that. You know? Um, and then they, they evaluated him and they said, well, we didn't, we didn't see he could touch his body parts. Like, could you show us how you get him to touch his body parts? And I was like, oh yeah, we have to, I have to sing the Barney song. First we touch our head and then I touch our toes and then we touch our belly, you know? And, um, I actually was showing him too. Um, and he was doing it with only with the song, not out of order. You couldn't say touch toes and then touch your head. It had to be head toes and then belly, um, in that order with a visual prompt. So you could see how it's confusing for parents. You want to like, so badly, you want your child to understand and to pass the test and to be okay. And, um, and a lot of people just really focus on that expressive language, that talking component when really we, we need to, we need to really figure out where they're at with comprehension. Just like I told you a little earlier that with the whole coronavirus thing, you know, there's all these visuals and social stories and all that stuff. Um, but if, if, children don't understand even basic language. Um, they're not going to be able to understand even with visuals, 
Um, even with books, they're not going to understand really much of anything. So we need to assess and we need to assess if it's a language comprehension issue, if it's a, or if it's a, like, I can't understand what you're saying versus I won't do it. I know what you're saying and I'm refusing either way, whether it's a can't problem or a won't problem, um, we still need to address it. Um, we need to address it with assessment, planning, good teaching, the right level of reinforcement, um, and maybe some data collection as well. I have found that with kids that aren't com conversational, 99 times out of a hundred, it's a language issue. It's a comprehension issue. Uh, there might be a component of can't, or of won't, but it's most of the time it's, it's predominantly a comprehension issue. Um, they're, you're not saying it in the right way. You're not, uh, giving them a visual, which they need in order to do it. Um, but when you test it, just like when I was testing body parts, you can't show them and test them at the same time. So if I say touch your head and the child touches their head, we don't know if we're assessing receptive language or if we're assessing imitation skills. So when you assess, you can't use your visuals. You can't uh, get out the stop sign and say stop because that's a visual prompt. So we're going to do better with visuals. You know, imagine yourself in a foreign country, you don't understand the language, but if somebody holds their hand up and gives you a stop signal or somebody touches their head and says something, you might be like, okay, maybe I'm supposed to touch my head. Um, but when we're assessing, we have to really kind of sit on our hands and say, touch your belly, touch your head, touch your elbow. And that's the way we're really going to assess whether the child can do it or not do it. We may be able to pull in and we may need to pull in visuals in order to teach it. And, but that involves careful planning to put in the prompt, to take out the prompt. Um, but for assessment reasons, we want to make sure that we are not giving visual prompts as we're assessing and not to just say, yeah, he knows most of his body parts, but to actually write them down. What body parts does he know? What doesn't he know? Some, a lot of kids get mixed up between eyes and ears. For instance, they might get the big body parts like head and belly and toes. Um, but, and you all also don't want to do it in the same order. Um, like head, shoulders, knees, and toes. Some kids then, if you um, say touch your head, they might go next to shoulders because they remember the song. So it can get a little tricky. So make sure you're writing things down, not going in the same order when you're assessing. So if you um, get problem behaviors while you're assessing, then the, the demands are probably too hard and or the reinforcement is too low. So if there's any component of, I, I won't do it. I won't sit and listen to this book you're reading. It's probably because you wouldn't sit and listen for 10 minutes to a book read in another language, would you, you know? Um, so we have to really make sure we're assessing very easy things, making it fun, maybe not doing all the body parts at once, maybe making it a part of a, a you know, they really like to play the ball. So you're bouncing the ball back and forth. And while you're holding the ball, you're saying, touch your knees and then, okay, they, whether they do it or not, you throw the ball back. And so you might want to make it fun, make the assessment really fun. Don't make it like this is a big test and now I've got to get all um, nervous or I don't really want to do it. So that's the assessment. The planning part is just like I said, we have to plan for when we're going to assess. We're going to have to plan for how we're going to teach it. And we're going to also have to plan for reinforcement. And there does seem to be some confusion um, with many people about you know, they might say they don't like ABA applied behavior analysis type of treatment because it uses reinforcement and I don't want to bribe my child. So there's a lot of confusion between bribery and reinforcement. 
And I did a video blog on bribery versus reinforcement. You may want to check out, but basically bribery is when you respond to problem behaviors, like I want the blue one, you know, and then you're like, well, if you, you know, if you do this, then I'll give you the blue one or stop screaming and I'll give you the blue one. So they're arguing with you or, um, even if they don't have the language to argue they're they're having some kind of problem behavior. And then you're saying, okay, let's just get in the car. And if you get in the car and they're in the middle of a problem behavior, get in the car, we will go get a donut. Um, so you're basically dangling the carrot in the middle of problem behavior which is bribery. Reinforcement is planned. It's adult led. It's not in reaction to problem behavior. It will actually do wonders to prevent problem behavior. And so it's a whole system of how much reinforcement you need, uh, really depends on the child, but you, do, you are going to need reinforcement in order to teach, um, harder skills. And for many kids with autism, they're so far behind that we have to do what we can to catch them up. And so planning is, is certainly really important and not just planning for what kind of visuals we might use. Like we might teach touch head and we show them and then we might do a transfer procedure, which, which I've done video blogs and podcasts on. Um, and then we may say touch head again without touching our own head. So we're doing an imitation and a receptive command, touch head with touching our, our head. They, they do the, the skill. Now we say touch head without showing them and see if we can transfer that skill and fade out the prompt. After assessing and planning, then it's, we're going to have to teach and we're going to have to probably teach in a systematic kind of way. Uh, we don't want to work on all the body parts, for instance, at the same time, we might want to just work on two or three because eyes and nose are so close and eyes and ears are so close. We probably don't want to teach them at the same time. We certainly don't want to teach like mouth and teeth at the same time because they're so close together. So we want to make that a part of our teaching plan to teach things that don't, that aren't too close in nature. Uh, we want to make sure that the overall task and the session is, is fun and light with lots of reinforcement. And we want to make sure that, um, harder tasks are sandwiched between easy tasks. So if you know that hand washing is not a real preferred, uh, skill, then you would want to do the hand washing practice, which I have a whole uh, bonus video that I released a couple weeks ago with the whole coronavirus first came out, um, on hand washing. So you may want to check that out, but say hand washing is not preferred. You're going to say, but going outside is preferred. So we're going to practice watching, washing our hands before we go outside. Then we're going to go outside. And then when we come back in, we, we can't go from a real high preferred outside to washing our hands necessarily, but we might want to transition in, uh, for five minutes, five pad time. Then we wash our hands, we get a snack. So you can see how we do easy, hard, easy, hard. And that's, uh, taking advantage of the pre-Mac principle, which is basically first eat your peas, and then you get dessert. Um, and that's what's known as the pre-Mac principle. Uh, making harder things first and then following them with easy or more reinforcing things. The other thing you want to keep in mind when you're teaching kids to follow directions is try to focus on tasks and directions where you can prompt. So a lot of uh, people, uh, parents with babies and, and um, young children, with or without autism, they're like, say hi, say hi. And the child, you can't make a child say hi, even if they're fully verbal, you can't make the child say hi. So in the case where your child may not be verbal or vocal or conversational, limit your, your commands like, um, wave high so that you're not saying, say hi, say hi. And then you, you realize, well, that's not going anywhere. Okay. Wave high. Also give directions that you want to follow through on. So if you're laying on the sofa and you're like, get me the remote, get me the remote. And you're pointing to the remote and the child's not attending. Um, 
and you just go get it yourself or you ask one of your other kids to get it for you, then you're not following through with the task. So give directions, which you can prompt and you can follow through on and you're willing to follow through on to teach. Um, like I said before, you don't want to take a child from a 10 to a two on the reinforcement scale from outside to, um, potty, which they don't like to do. And we have to constantly working on pairing up potty, pairing up hand washing, pairing up anything the child doesn't like to do because we don't want a child crying for anything. We don't want a child, um, where we're really struggling with the child. If the child is not happily doing something, our reinforcement system is probably not where it needs to be. You also may want to check out my transitioning from high preferred to low preferred. Um, I have a cheat sheet. I have a video blog and we can link that all below. We also want to, whatever we're teaching, especially if we're teaching receptive language and comprehension skills is we want to simplify the language, um, whenever possible. So instead of Johnny, go up the stairs and get your shoes and put them on. And then we're going to go in the car. Um, that's a lot, that's multiple step direction. So you want to make it where the child is 95% going to get it right. You know, whether the shoes have to be in sight, whether you have to point to them, get your shoes or without a point, get your shoes. If they're in the same place all the time. Um, and if he doesn't get the shoes then you're going to have to gently prompt him to go find the shoes, get the shoes and bring them back. Um, so you want to simplify the language all always and try not to use a lot, a whole lot of words. And then also we want to always focus on trying to give five to eight positives for every negative. So it's like, you know, get the shoes. Nice job getting the shoes. Let me help you put them on. You're such a good boy. Help them put them on. Now, you know, you give the child direction to let's go get your jacket or go get your jacket or whatever the next step is. Um, we constantly want to have an environment where we're giving praise, we're giving thumbs up, pat on the back, smiles. And if you find yourself resorting to no, stop, that's not right. I told you once, I told you four times, let's do it. Those are all negative, 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 negative. We want to create positive environments at school, at home, in the community, wherever your child or client is at. So in summary, when we're teaching receptive language skills, comprehension skills, following directions, we want to make sure we assess, we assess without visuals so that we can really see what the child knows and what they don't know. We want to plan for reinforcement and plan what kind of materials we're going to need to teach direction following. We're going to use simplified language and we're always going to try to be, use eight positives to every negative. You also may want to always make sure you're, um, as close to the child as possible when you're giving the directions, maybe if they're very young and very little, small, you want to get down to their level, give the direction calmly versus, you know, across the room. And we really want to give, give directions in a very nice, friendly tone. Uh, it might have to be simplified and more exaggerated and more fun. The more fun and positive, the better. And we do want to pull in visuals to teach. We're just going to have to make sure we fade out those prompts. So we might want to, like I said, touch your head while you're giving the direction to touch head. We might you want to pull out a stop sign to teach children to stop at the end of a street. Um, we may want to use visual token systems, um, like my bear token system that I talk about in my online courses. So we, we do want to provide visuals. Most of us, including typically developing adults learn best with visuals. We just want to be able to systematically fade out those visuals. So the child really can function as well as possible in the world. And uh, if you think about everything that that kids are exposed to, especially in school settings, 
Um, it involves a lot of comprehension abilities. Comp and so don't just think of language as speaking. Think of language as understanding the world around you, understanding the language, um, understanding the safety, safety rules, understanding game, game rules, understanding everything that's happening. And that is a process. And for many kids, it's, um, it's just an ongoing, uh, thing that we have to constantly be assessing and teaching based on where the child is at. Thanks for joining me today. I hope you liked that podcast on teaching comprehension issues. And if you did, I would love it if you would leave me a review or a rating and share it with friends. Tell everyone you know, parents or professionals, to tune in to the Turn Autism Around podcast anywhere you listen to podcasts.